Water is life. But there's evidence coronavirus could survive in it for days. Clean water is key. One in three people don't have access to safe drinking water. And shortages have hit places like Zimbabwe. Waiting for a water truck, a daily chore before the crisis. Now demand is spiking, washing hands frequently, cleaning everything. Wastewater testing is also key to staving off the virus and detecting a second wave. It's in the water. How big a role does water play in the fight against the pandemic? In a moment, we'll ask a water expert in Washington. And it's not just drinking water we're talking about. Monitoring waste water is also important. This is where it all ends up. The Stammheim sewage treatment plant. The basins are full of coronavirus, like in any such facility. But the virus is already dead by the time it gets here. It can, however, still be detected in the water. In the laboratory at the plant, manager Andrea Poppa shows us a sample. Could the coronavirus be in there? Yes, the coronavirus is in there, especially this sample. It comes directly from the sewers. We assume the largest amount of the virus is in there. And in the course of the purifying process, the water gets cleaner and cleaner. You can see that here. Then there are the next steps. It gets a lot clearer. And this is the last step. That means the water leaves here pure. At the edge of the huge company premises is this inconspicuous box. Inside is a fully automatic water extraction system. Samples are taken here 365 days a year before the sewage water is purified. It sounds simple, but it isn't because the water contains things that could clog the pipes. A vacuum pump is installed in the sewage extraction system. A suction hose leads to the sewer and the water sample enters the system through a sieve basket. Why do you need the sieve? The sieve is designed to keep some of the material in the wastewater out of the system. Some of the samples are analysed at the in-house laboratory during regular routine checks. Some are stored in this refrigerator. The containers are sent to the Helmholtz Centre for Environmental Research in Leipzig. Nineteen other German sewage treatment plants send samples there too for analysis and comparison. Based on the concentration of viruses in wastewater, it's possible to conclude how high the level of infection is in Cologne, for example. When things go back to normal, levels drop. If we examine it on a daily basis or several times a week, we can see if levels rise again. We can see if we have to take extra precautions or if we can reduce some measures. If the scientists' calculations are accurate, they can develop models to compare the measurements in different regions, even if the water is diluted by rain. In the end, 900 wastewater treatment plants in Germany can be analysed, painting a picture of the coronavirus's expansion. And for more, let's bring in Peter Gravatt. He's a chief executive officer at the Water Research Foundation in Washington, D.C. Good to have you with us. Um, let me start yeah. with uh, the connection between wastewater and the virus. We heard that the virus found in sewage is always dead. Is that true or could it still be contagious? We have never actually found live virus in the sewage, so we don't have any... any uh, uh, evidence that the virus is actually contagious in sewage. At the same time, we want to be careful and make sure that sewage workers are using personal protective equipment because we know there are other pathogens in sewage. And of course, uh, because uh, wastewater tracing is already done for, for certain drugs and so forth, what is the threshold of concentration of coronavirus in sewage uh, that would actually represent a concern? Well, we haven't seen any evidence of fecal to oral transmission of coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. Uh, but uh, so we don't actually have a good sense of whether there's a threshold level that would be of concern. But again, that's why we want to make sure that sewer workers are using their personal protective equipment just, just to be safe. 
But what exactly are you looking at? Uh, my understanding is that uh, in, in, in testing wastewater for uh, coronavirus, uh, that gives us an idea uh, about the concentration of the pandemic in a certain area. Is that correct? That is correct. And wastewater has a story to tell about the health of the community. And so when we're testing wastewater, what we're testing for is the genetic signal of the virus, the RNA. So we're not testing the virus itself. And we have found that that genetic signal is very closely correlated with the presence of disease in communities. So it does provide the opportunity to track the progress of the pandemic in communities. So, so you would say this is a pretty accurate uh, an indication to go by, also perhaps to introduce new lockdowns if necessary? Well, we think this information is very helpful to supplement the information we have from clinical testing. It's not a substitute for clinical testing, but the importance of this information is that it can provide an early warning. In fact, there have been a number of studies that have shown that the genetic signal in wastewater was seen as much as a week before the first clinical case was identified in a community. And so we think it does provide very important information. Of course, you need water in order to get that information. You need waste and water. And uh, unfortunately, in some parts of the wa world, water is a scarce commodity, also due to climate change. Um, what chance do people then in arid areas, let's say in Africa or also in parts of Asia, have in the fight against coronavirus? This is a very significant challenge, and we're currently working with African research partners to uh, introduce these wastewater uh, tracing techniques to understand the presence of COVID-19 in communities. And I know those partners are also working very hard to make sure that there's fresh water available for communities to be able to wash their hands. And we know that's such an important part of protecting individuals against the coronavirus. So it is a very significant challenge. Is, is SARS-CoV-2 uh, only found in wastewater? And you already said uh, so far there hasn't been a live one found. Uh, can it also get into, into clean water, tap water? Is that safe? A very important question. And as I said, we haven't seen the presence of COVID-19 in wastewater nor have we seen it in tap water. Uh, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, the virus, is very sensitive to chlorine. And so we expect that the disinfection of tap water would be quite protective against SARS-CoV-2. But we have not seen the virus in uh, drinking water. How are we going about uh, enjoying summer? I mean, you mentioned chlorine, so swimming pools should be safe. What if I want to jump into a lake or the open sea? Well, what I would say is, is that our biggest concern actually related to recreational activities and swimming is social distancing. And we know that infection through the respiratory route, through the breathing route of exposure, is a, a very important way that people are becoming sick. And so I would be more concerned about making sure that people were maintaining social distancing when they were in a pool or a lake or the ocean, then I would be worried about the presence of the virus in that water. But these are areas of, of continuing research, and that's why at the Water Research Foundation, we're making sure that we get the science right in understanding both the presence of the virus in wastewater and the potential for the virus in drinking water or other water supplies. All right, Peter Gravat, the Chief Executive Officer at the Water Research Foundation in Washington. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you as well. Time for your questions. Here's our science correspondent, Derek Williams. What is a virus? How does it work? I've answered this one a couple of times over the last several months, but the question pops up over and over, so it's, it's time to answer it again. Um, a virus is little more than a collection of genetic information, either RNA or DNA, protected by a, a protein coat, which is sometimes covered by an, an outer fatty layer. Um, viruses are not viewed as full-fledged life forms because they don't make their own energy. They, they have to steal it. To replicate, uh, viruses have to invade living cells, like those in your respiratory tract. Um, they're able to dock on to specific receptors on the cell's outer membrane, and they're either 
absorbed or they inject their genetic code into its interior. Now, once inside, the invader hijacks cellular machinery to, to churn out more viruses, which, which burst out of the infected cell to infect others. Um, that whole process and, and how your immune system deals with it is what we call viral infection and disease. Scientists think SARS-CoV-2 originated in bats. Does it kill them as well, or have they adapted to live with it? Bats are, are amazing in lots of ways, not, not least because of their immune systems. Many studies have shown that although they can carry many viruses, they somehow seem to be quite resistant to the diseases that those viruses can cause. Um, we think that ability has evolved because many bat species live in, in vast colonies that, that roost in very crowded conditions where any infection could, could quickly wipe out huge numbers of animals. And, and we're slowly learning more about how we think it all works. In, in a recent study, for example, that looked at how bat cells reacted to the coronavirus that causes MERS, Canadian researchers found evidence that the animal's immune systems come to, come to terms with the infection rather than trying to fight it off, basically striking a balance with the virus rather than declaring war on it. So, so they don't get rid of the virus, but they don't get sick either. Um, and, and that mechanism likely works the same with other coronaviruses as well. Are there any books you would suggest to improve someone's understanding of COVID-19 or pandemics in general? I really like this original question. It was, it was inspired by my bookshelves. Um, I get lots of comments on them. And as a matter of fact, there is indeed a book on a pandemic that I read a few years ago and that I really learned a lot from. It's called The Chimp and the River, How AIDS Emerged from an African Forest. It's by, by David Quammen, a, a well-known American science writer and author. It's absolutely compelling. And, and if you think epidemiology is a dry science, it'll change your mind. I mean, sometimes it reads like a murder mystery. So for, for anyone interested in, in deeper background on, on how a pandemic can arise and, and sweep across the planet, I can highly recommend it. And just before we go from face mask shortages to masks simply littered on city streets, or as in this case, Australia's beautiful beaches. A cleanup's underway along Sydney's coastline after this all washed up. It's debris from at least 40 containers that fell off a cargo ship. Uh, it also included medical supplies.